thank you, Pierre, and uh, well, thank you for for inviting me to this uh, to this uh, seminar. So um, today, I will I will try to present some of the techniques that are usually used for say large scale data integration. So in particular. Uh, using some of the techniques that we call knowledge engineering and in particular semantic web. So some of you may be familiar with, with them. I know Pia, you have already worked a lot with these technologies in some of your projects. Uh, anyway, I, I will try to stay not too technical, maybe to remain at, at the rather conceptual level. Um, and in the, in the examples I will give in this talk, I, I will focus on some applications for biodiversity data. Uh, but anyway, just understand that these are just examples and basically those techniques do apply in, in any, any other kind of, uh, of domain or wh whatever the data that you're dealing with, those techniques would apply equally the same. Okay, so maybe I will uh, start with a reminder of what we call data integration in, in case this is not so clear for everybody. So maybe you, you are aware that uh, since 2020, we have undergone a pandemic. Uh, and actually, this crisis has been uh, the occasion for the production of a huge amount of data. And as a scientist, you may want to cross those data. You may want to create mashups, uh, that is, combine the data. You may want to repurpose the data, that is, take some data and use it in some other context. Uh, and what for? Well, basically, to come up with new leads to come up with maybe scientific hypotheses that you would, you would like to test. Uh, and all of these things, that th these operations are what we call data integration in a very global term. That is the, all the methods that enable combining and making sense of heterogeneous data. So let's take an example. In the, the case of the pandemic, uh, as a scientist, you may want to cross some uh, statistics about how the disease spreads around the world with some existing databases about uh, proteins and genomes. Uh, maybe you would like also to go for uh, not academic resources, but more crowdsourced information like Wikipedia. Uh, you may want to check uh, what's in economic studies, maybe to, to check the interaction of uh, the average income with how the disease spreads and everything. Uh, you may also want to uh, check information that comes from tracking applications, the many tracking applications that have been developed in, developed in all the countries. And maybe another example could be just social networks, that is, I don't know, tweets that are exchanged uh, with some given hashtags. Okay. Well, when you want to make sense of all of these data, you have a problem, which is that these are totally disparate data. They vary a lot in terms of nature, what it represents in terms of volume, and of course, in terms of complexity. Uh, so to answer this question, you will have to address the heterogeneity of all of these data. And that the heterogeneity usually falls into two categories, structural heter heterogeneity, which is about how the data is represented. So would you have files, maybe structured files like XML or JSON, flat files, maybe free text, maybe relational databases or whatever. Uh, so to overcome this, this kind of structural heterogeneity, you're going to have to come, come up with some uniform representation of the data that applies everywhere. Then the second type of heterogeneity is about the semantics of the, of the data. That is, how can you ensure that two elements from two separate data sources will actually mean the same thing, or maybe that they are connected somehow? Maybe one of them, one of the things is a generalization or a specialization of another, and so on. So, how you can express this is going to be uh, achieved using some sort of knowledge formalization. And when we talk about knowledge formalization, we talk about control vocabularies maybe other terms like thesauruses and ontologies. I will not get into the details, but you get the idea. This is formal uh, ways of expressing how you name things and, and what you refer to. Um, okay, so there, there is a longer history uh, of works to address these kind of challenges. Data integration is, is a long lasting issue in computer science. Uh, and in, in the domain, that we call knowledge engineering, in particular semantic web, 
we have lots of techniques and technologies that can help us uh, achieve the, this kind of data interoperability. Um, so in the, the semantic web is, is defined uh, this way by the W3C. This is a, a sentence I have uh, taken from the W3C website. It's just a little bit adapted. And it says that the semantic web provides an environment where applications can publish data, that is typically publish data on the web, link data, that is create links between the data that are similar throughout data sets, define vocabularies, that is references that allow you to name things in an unambiguous way, and query data at web scale, and finally, draw inferences. So draw inferences is, is, is the ability to reason on the data to infer new facts. Um, another term that you may have heard of is the web of data. So uh, that's, uh, yeah, you, you can hear it in, in lots of different contexts right now, but, and, and, and it can have different names. So sometimes you can, uh, here, web 3.0 or data web or di distributed knowledge graph, whatever. It is always the same thing, more or less. Uh, knowledge graph is the more fancy term. Now we don't talk so much about web of data. It's a bit outdated, but knowledge graph is much more fashionable right now. Uh, but anyway, when we talk about the web of data, what we, we make difference between the web of document and web of data. Web of documents it's meant for humans. That is, you and I, the web that we check every day, the documents that we can get to read. The web of data is very similar. The only difference is that who consumes the data is not humans, but machines. So it has the, the data has to be structured in a different way so that machines will understand them. Um, so the web of data is just is not another web. It's, it's just another layer on top of the web. But basically, it's just a question of who consumes the data, humans or machines. Um, and if we get back to the semantic web definition that I was using just uh, two slides before, you can amend this, this definition to get the one of the web of data. And basically, it says that the web of data provides an environment where you can applications can publish and link data, define vocabularies, and query data at web scale. And the only difference with the semantic web will be the inference part. And the inference part is quite a big part of the semantic web. There are a lot of work on how to represent logics and reason on logics. Overall, you can say, yeah, that's a, say, say, a, uh, uh, yeah, I don't find the word, but you, you, you can you can think of the web of data like semantic web minus inference. Um, now, the web of data derives from some principles that are called the linked data principles that were announced uh, like 20 years ago by Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, hence, we speak of the web of linked data or linked open data cloud. All these terms are more or less similar. Um, <laughs> So this is a picture that you may you may have seen already. This is the diagram that is called the linked open data cloud, the load cloud. So basically, how to read this diagram is that each little color colored bubble here represents a data set. Uh, it is a data set that's been published on the web under an open license. It's machine readable, so it uses the, the format from the semantic web, which is called RDF. Things are named using URIs and HTTP URIs, and they use command vocabularies. But more importantly, there are links between the data sets. So you could, you could imagine that one of those uh, links, I'm trying to get my mouse, one of those uh, bubbles here is, I don't know, NCBI uh, taxonomy, or maybe it's uh, some outcome on some phenotyping platform or any kind of, of knowledge that has been produced and published in according to those principles. And what really matters is the links that you draw between different uh, data sets so that, like in the web, you can move from one document to, to the other one using, using hyperlinks. Well, in the web of data, you will move from data to data and from data sets to data sets through the links that have been drawn and, and expressed by the authors of the, of the data set. Now, this diagram is maybe the only representation that we have of the web of data, but it's actually very incomplete. 
it, 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 the, the reason is that uh, the, the data sets that are represented here are just the ones that were explicitly registered by the authors which means that all the others that were not explicitly registered do not appear here, but they are still out there and probably very useful. So there are some estimation that says there are about 25,000 data sets, so much, many more than what we have here. But anyway, the, the general idea is that those data sets are here published out there on the web and linked together. So, okay, uh, now you may wonder at this point, okay, how is this, useful for you, for your daily work, for your research. Well, to illustrate the use of these semantic web technologies and link data stuff, uh, in the rest of this talk, I will touch upon three specific use cases uh, that are different, three different applications of those technologies to solve issues in the domain of the biodiversity. Those, the first one will be about how we can integrate data, web data sources on the fly. That is, dynamically, sources exist out there and you're just gonna make this integration, whatever their format initially, you just deal with it and you, you're gonna do this integration on the fly. So that's what we call web APIs that, that I, I will say we're more specifically on that in, in just a moment. The second use case will be about the construction of a knowledge graph to represent taxonomic information and to publish that as linked open data. And the last uh, use case will be about how we can mark up web pages uh, to improve their discoverability and to, in the end, enable web scale data integration. Okay, so I will start with the, the first one. Uh, so on the fly integration of web data sources I have added here independent yet related web data sources. What I mean here is that you, you maybe you know that this term web API, uh, an API is application programming interface. So it's an interface, a web API is, is an interface published on the web by some data producer or service, host, uh, service producer that allows you to interact with the service consume the data. So you have web APIs for almost anything on the web. You have the social networks, of course, the entertainment, and also, of course, lots of web APIs regarding the academic world at large. These APIs are basically things that you can just query using a URL. You submit a URL with a few parameters and you will get an answer matching your your request. For instance, if you're searching information uh, from uh, PubMed, you will just issue uh, the, a query with a few parameters and get a JSON document in response. Okay. Now, this the, these web APIs are very useful because they put a lot of information out there available on the web for everybody to consume, but they have some limitations. The first one is that they are documented in web pages. So they are okay for developers, but you need the developers to actually read them but a machine will not be able to make sense of that automatically. They use XML or JSON, okay, fair enough. But even then, I mean, the, proper, the, the vocabularies that they use is totally proprietary. And as a consequence, there is no semantics, or at least it's not explicit. That is, you get a, a JSON file with some field names, but well, you kind of guess what it means, but you have to go to the documentation to understand it really. Um, and last thing, but not, not the, the minus one, uh, not, not the, the least important, is that you have internal resource identifiers. That is, uh, I don't know, if you go to YouTube, each video has an identifier in YouTube. You have a URL for the web page. Where is there a URI, something that will identify the video itself, whatever its representation, whether it's on a web page or anything. So you, you don't really get the, this kind of global unique identifiers shareable on the web. Okay, so these limitations have two main impacts. The first one is that if you want to write an application that will gather information from several sources, from several web APIs at a time, it's going to be kind of cumbersome. You're going to have to develop connectors like here for, let's say you're doing, uh, you're gathering information about 
fishes or anything like you, you want to get some information from worms, worms from fish base and maybe G beef. Well, you're going to write some specific connectors from that and, and then you're going to get the results and you're going to have to align yourself. I mean, the developer will, will have to align the information coming from each and every source saying uh, actually that information from worms, worms corresponds to that information from fish base and that other information in, in, in G beef. This is feasible, but it's, it's not so easy and it, it's pretty time consuming. The second limitation, the second impact is that, okay, look at those two worlds. On the one side, on the left, you have the web APIs. On the right, you have the web of data that I was just describing a few minutes ago. These two worlds have more or less the same incentive that is provide useful data to the world, but still technically it's pretty difficult to make sense of all of, of these two worlds, although they, they have the same uh, rational, okay? So uh, in the work we did in, in the Wimix team, we proposed a method to integrate data from these different web data sources using the semantic web technologies. So yeah, I, I did not resist to uh, put this, this picture. So for, for those of you, of you who are familiar with Tolkien, uh, you will understand that because it sound, kind of sounds like the Lord of the Rings. Um, the idea is to say, okay, let's have a uniform model that will accommodate all the data sources and a unique language to query them all. So that uniform model will be RDF. RDF is the conceptual model that allows to represent any kind of data in the, the context of the semantic web. So it's a graph data representation. And the unique query language to query, query them all is, is the the W3C standard that comes with, with RDF, which is Sparkle, to query RDF graphs. Um, now, the idea is that you could find, you, you, you will try to find a model on which you can map all the data sources. So a common model that will be able to accommodate all the data sources. Uh, it will, this model will have a role of pivot, see, pivot representation for, for everything. So in this example, uh, we want to gather and compare taxonomic information from multiple data sources. So we have uh, worms, GB, fish base, and other biodiversity sources. So we can look at the data that's provided. All of them provide scientific names and authorship, taxonomic ranks. Some provide habitat, parent taxon synonyms, and, and so on and so on. Well, you can come up with a model that will be able to represent this information in a uniform manner, whatever the source. So you don't care anymore about where the data comes from. It just represented in the same way. Uh, plus, the model that we use will use will rely on existing well-known and well-adapted vocabularies, so that this model here on the right will actually be understandable by actually literally anybody. Anybody who's in the community knows vocabularies like Darwin Core. Well, if you use Darwin Core, then anybody can understand that, and the idea is that you will define wrappers that will allow you to look at all of these data sources through the same exact model. That's the uniform model that we use. And then what happens where in the beginning you had to develop an application with connectors to each of the APIs and so on. Now, the application will be much more simple. You say, okay, here are the wrappers. That's what we call the Sparkle microservices. For, so for each source, you de define such a wrapper that will align the data source to your uniform data model. And then from the application, the only thing you see is the uniform model and the same query language everywhere. So it's much more simple and much more easy to maintain. Now, the second thing I was mentioning was about how to make, to, to be able to gather and make sense of information coming from web APIs on one side and the web of data on the other side. Well, that works exactly the same. With this, this, this technology, the Spike microservices, you can actually query all the data coming from both worlds using the same technologies, Sparkle, RDF is the conceptual model, and your model, if, if you're using here a uniform model yeah, that uses Darwin Core, well, probably you, it's gonna be pretty easy to align it with data that you have in AgroVoc and in CBI taxon or environment ontology and so on. So you have now a way to make sense of those two worlds at the same time and go forward and backward. So you create an actual real bridge between those two worlds. 
Uh, and this is uh, an example. This is actually a prototype, a demonstration that I have developed to illustrate the use of this technology. So basically, what you see here is a web page that is generated dynamically uh, from multiple sources. So I basically I just enter the name of a species, which is uh, the beluga in this case, the Delphina terus lucas, and then dynamically I will get data from several web APIs. Uh, GBIF to have occurrence information, uh, photos from Flickr, Encyclopedia of Life to have uh, life traits, articles from biodiversity heritage libraries, library, and uh, some audio recording of that species from the Macaulay Library. So dynamically, all these APIs are invoked using my Sparkle microservices. But what I see from the application is always, like I said, the same uniform model. And I just reconstruct all of this data and generate the web page. So it, it proves to be to be very useful. And we are now having some applications of these kind of things with the Museum of Natural History. So I'm not getting further here, but it uh, it's getting more and more used in, in, in this area. But again, that we have applications in biodiversity, but it can be applied in any literally any domain. Okay, so second use case I would like to present now is about <clears throat> the construction of a knowledge graph to represent taxonomic information as linked open data. Uh, so you're probably much more aware than me than uh, taxonomic registers are uh, a key element within the, the applications of, uh, that deal with biodiversity data and, and actually probably uh, beyond just biodiversity because taxonomic registers are a backbone. They are the, the, the very heart of your databases and applications. So they are the, the pivot on which you can actually achieve integration throughout different biological domains and regions and epochs. So you could feel like, well, given their, this very singular position of, of the backbone, it makes sense to, to think of those registers as very good candidates, natural candidates for the publication in the web of data, because they're going to have a very structuring role. Uh, and as a, as a matter of fact, there are there are already quite some taxonomic registers that have been published in the web of data. Uh, there is, for instance, uh, Agrovoc, uh, NCBI taxonomy, but also other ones like plant ontology, environment ontology, and so on. And not only they are published, but they are linked together. So there are some links that say, well, that species in Agrovoc is equivalent to that species in geospecies, which is equivalent to that other species in NCBI taxon. That means that when you're using one of those references in the web of data, you have a direct way of moving from one, one taxonomic register to another one. And, and that makes links between the applications that exploit those references. Now, there exists uh, such a taxonomic register uh, in France. It's maintained by the Museum of Natural History and it's called TaxRef. Uh, so TaxRef uh, accounts for almost 600,000 scientific names today, 186,000 uh, species. Um, and uh, so it, it covers mainland France and overseas territories. That's the reason why it's much smaller in number of names than NCBI, for instance. Uh, and it's uh, published in different ways. So you have a website, like here you have a snapshot. Uh, there is a web service, which is basically a web API, and uh, you can download CSV files. Now we have worked with the museum uh, to produce a linked data representation of that uh, taxonomic register and publish it in the web of data. So. In this work, we have we had several main goals, which were first to be relevant at the same time for biologists and semantic web people. So what I mean here is when you talk to taxonomists, what matters is that a species is not just a name. A name is just a tag. A species, a taxon, more generally, is a set of biological individuals that have something in common and you relate them to names that not just one name, several names. Uh, so the names are regulated by the nomenclature, which is some sort of dark art of taxonomists. And uh, you, so you, you have to take very much care of splitting these two things, taxonomy and nomenclature. 
these are very two, two very important concepts. And if you want to share the knowledge that you have about some taxonomy somewhere in the world and make it available on the web, you have to express this. You have to represent all of this, uh, the nature of the information. It's not like you have a database that you put on the world because people would need to talk, talk to you to say, okay, what's in the database? What is in this table? What is the sense of this column? So here you, you need to have a way to express your data in a self-contained way. Nobody needs to ask you anything. You just put the data and it's self-described, okay? So that's what I mean by relevant to biologists and relevant for semantic web people because those people are those who develop the applications that exploit the semantic web data. And so you have to follow the rules. Uh, there are some specific concepts. What is a class? What is uh, a concept in the, in the domain of the semantic web? These are some specific terms that refer to how to organize knowledge. So you have to be relevant for that. So I'm not getting into, into further details, but that's something we have taken great care of. The second thing, the second goal was to be able to accommodate taxonomic changes. So I was mentioning the difference between names and taxa. Well, you know that there are recombinations of names. Uh, today, a species has that name and tomorrow, maybe it's gonna have another name because some new scientific evidence shows that it's actually the same thing as another species. So you will recombine the names and you have to come up with a model that will be able to accommodate with that because changes occur every day. Uh, and of course, we are in the web of data. So we need to focus very much on about linking. So how to have a data set that is easily interlinked with other data sets, other taxonomic registers. Um, and uh, lastly, we have made quite an effort also on reusing existing vocabularies. The point is to do with what exists out there and just coin new terms when you need them. But if you want your data to be understandable, for people, you have to use the same vocabularies as everybody. Uh, so now this data set is published. There is uh, basic taxonomic information, habitats, different types of statuses, uh, bibliographical references, geographic locations, species interactions. And we are now working on a, an extension to uh, represent life traits, which is something that should come during this year. Now, uh, well, the result is that TaxRef LD, the link data version of TaxRef, is now published on the web of data. It has its own bullet here in, in this diagram. And again, the nice thing is that it is linked with other applications, other taxonomic registers. So whenever you link to TaxRef, you have a direct way to link to NCBI taxon. And then maybe you can use some other applications that is based on an NCBI taxon, and then you have a point of connection. So you can connect different applications developed on different registers because you have done these, these links and these are all published on the web. That's the very inner power of link data, connecting things. Uh, and uh, so now, Biodiversity increasingly adopts these semantic web technologies and the interest of uh, uh, using tax FLD grows with it. So these are an exam uh, a few examples of uh, applications and projects that, that exploit tax LD today. Uh, one of them, I, I just mentioned this one is, is D2CAB. Uh, Pierre is, is also a member of, of that project, which is about creating a large knowledge graph that uh, aggregates and makes sense of agronomy agriculture and biodiversity data. Uh, okay, so I will come to the last uh, use case that I wanted to mention, which is uh, about the marking up of web pages and life science web pages in this case with the Bioschemas project. So maybe just before I start this, uh, I will try to remind what markup means. Um, if you go to IMDb and look up a movie, like in this, in this case, uh, in Mood for Love, you will get something that just looks a regular web page. You have different sorts of information about uh, the director, the uh, actors, and everything. Now, if you look at the code of the page, there is a section which is not visible on the web page, but it still is there. Uh, and this Hey, this section is not encoding, encoded here for humans, it's here for machines. So you have some information that you can find on the web page, which is, for instance, the director here that you will find in this structured piece of data here. And uh, you can so see also that this 
information here, type movie, it says basically the thing that is represented on that web page is a movie. And a movie, which is just not, not just a term, but it's within the namespace, which is schema.org. Okay, so what is this? This is what we call marking up web pages. That is, embed some information that's not meant for humans, but for machines. And that makes the web page interpretable, understandable for machines. And the first goal for this is search engines. So we put markup so that search engine can understand better the web pages and then rank them better and provide better summarizations and so on. And not only search engines, but there are also other applications that can actually consume this data. Now, if you Google the, the name of that movie in the mood for love, you will get a list of results. And indeed, you will get a result from IMDb and you will have all this information here. And you see that it's, it's already structured. Google knows what, who is the director, what is the release date and what is the language. And here you're gonna, gonna find it again and you have a rating and so on. And that precisely comes from the markup information. It's not just by parsing the web page, the text, free text that they know that, but they have passed that structured information that gives you gives them much uh, structured, much more understandable information about the movie. Um, now, markup can be done in, in different ways. And the most prominent uh, way today is schema.org. I just mentioned it. So schema.org is uh, basically, uh, it's a collaborative project. It was funded by a few uh, small startups in 2011, that is uh, Bing, Google, Yahoo, and Yandex. Yandex is a Russian speaking search engine. Uh, so, so initially the, the goal was to define a vocabulary to mark up resources on the internet. So I insist on the internet, meaning not just the web. So that can be web pages, but that could be used to mark up information within emails or any kind of, of resource that you exchange on the internet. Uh, and and the, the point is to have a vocabulary to represent structured data so that search engines can understand that. And initially it was for most common resources on the web. So it was like uh, uh, describing a car or a cooking recipe or some events, a concert, a music album, whatever, all of those things that you can see on Amazon, say, all right? Um, and this structured information helps the search engine make sense. That is, understand what's in there, index the web pages better, uh, improve the ranking, the discoverability of the web pages, and so on. Now, um, the good thing about schema.org is that it was designed to be extensible. And as a matter, as a matter of fact, there is there are some extensions, multiple. One of them is an extension for the life sciences. So we're not so much interested about marking up web pages about cars and concerts, but much more about marking up web pages about, I don't know, uh, phenotype information or some genes and proteins. Well, that's the point of bioschemas. So it's yet another community project. It's totally independent from schema.org, um, but it involves people from projects like Elixir and big life science initiatives. And the goal is exactly the same as schema.org, that is help search engines to understand what's in the web page and rank them and provide better summarizations and better results and so on, but specifically and that very specific domain, life sciences. So uh, the approach is to reuse and extend schema.org to keep it simple, that is, the point is not to come up with a vocabulary that will end up being like a large domain ontology. It's not at all about that. It's really about having a high level way of marking up things that are on a web page, basically. Um, the project provides different guidelines as to how you would use the terms, the different types that you get to describe a gene, to describe a protein, and uh, it's, it's rather flexible. That is, these are just recommendations, okay? We are on the web. It's not like a relational database where everything has to comply strictly with some rules because the schema is like that. No, it's the web. People follow the rules or not. And many times they do not. So you have to deal with that. that that's why it, ha it has to be very flexible. Um, and in the current status, there are quite a lot of terms that were defined so that you can markup web pages that would talk about some chemical substance, some gene, 
protein, some samples, uh, some bio samples of phenotype, protein structure, ARN, and so on. And we have, uh, I have worked with the biodiversity group to the definition of two terms, which are taxon and taxon name, so that we now have a way of annotating web pages, marking up web pages that talk about a specific taxon. But these already exist for, for and I know many, many of you will be interested in this, for marking up web pages about protein genes and uh, phenotypes. Typically, I think this is more the kind of activities you have at Dyad. Um, so now let me show let me let me show you the big picture of what we are trying to achieve here with this the definition of these terms. So the picture is this: uh, having one website marking up web pages is basically totally useless. The, the interest comes when many many people do it. So again, I will focus on the biodiversity area, but think large, and that the thing will be exactly the same for uh, other domains. Now. Uh, if in the, the domain of biodiversity, people start generalizing this approach of marking up web pages, if uh, big portals like GB, an Encyclopedia of Life, Catalog of Life, the uh, digital collections, all of these people start marking up the web pages. But then you can think also of museum collections. There are thousands of museums that have their own website. What if they start annotating their pages with those terms, the taxon, taxon name term, but maybe other terms? Uh, what about the literature website like Biodiversity Heritage Library? But there was also maybe lots of different other initiatives like citizen platforms, citizen science platforms, and independent institutions and associations. Think about uh, what we call the gray literature. There are all those reports and uh, CSV files that are just on your laptop. But what if you just publish them on a web page and annotate the web page and say, OK, by the way, that CSV file talks about this protein of this taxon, well, that gives a way for people to find it and make sense of it. And, and what for? Well, there are lots of applications. So I've mentioned a lot search engines, which are the, the first usage of marking up web pages, but there is much more. You can use that to make aggregators, aggregators that will scrape the data from the web pages, aggregate, make sense of it, and maybe republish that as knowledge graphs on the web, on the web of data. Maybe you're going to create registries so that you can know, you would know where to point to when you look at some information for some specific protein. And yet again, you could republish that on the web of data. Um, and then you can come up with unlimited number of ideas about applications that would have, I don't know, very clever ideas of how to use those. So this is this is the main the, the main idea of doing this. So th this is this project is is ongoing, of course, but there are more and more uh, pages, web pages that are annotated this way um, in the biodiversity area, of course, but also and even many more uh, in the context of bioinformatics. There are lots of websites now that are annotated this way. And we hope in the future is going to be a, a tremendous way of discovering resources in a much more uh, uh, relevant way than what you do with just a search engine. So maybe you can connect that with data set search engines like the Google data set search. And in the end, we can hope that you will be able to say, I want to find a data set that talks about this gene and this other gene related to that taxon. See, that, that's the kind of thing that we are heading to. So it could become extremely powerful. OK, so uh, this will be almost the end. And I will just, just uh, try to summarize a little bit what I've done here. So. Uh, my point was to present very say, briefly from a high level perspective, semantic web and link data technologies and see how they can help us carry out data integration. So they provide a way to uh, represent the semantics of the data in an explicit manner and in a machine processable manner. Um, there are multiple scenarios in, in which you can use these technologies to do data integration. You can consider those as a toolbox. So you don't need to apply all the principles and all the technologies at once. You just start little and you can follow a pay as you go approach. So you can start by saying, okay, I'm trying to reuse vocabularies whenever they exist. There are well adopted vocabularies within some community that matches my needs. Okay, let's use it. Uh, you can start assigning URIs to anything that you're dealing with. 
are a, a protein, a phenotype, a plant within a phenotyping platform, whatever, you can assign a URI to that. And better be an HTTP URI and better be some URI that you can look up. And if you look it up, maybe you can provide a web page. But if this is a machine, well, you will provide it with not a web page, but an RDF representation. But that's going to be the same thing anyway. And then links, links, that is, again, this is the web of data is about connecting things together. And that's the very power of it. Now, I just showed a few examples of, of uh, use cases and usages of those technologies. I'm not going through them again, uh, but these technologies are overall one way towards uh, the goals that we are uh, requested to pursue now, which is uh, providing open scientific data, doing open science, and in the end, achieve fairness, fairness, which is how to make your data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Well, those technologies are clearly a good lead towards being able to provide fair data and open science and yeah, open data in the end. Uh, and I think this is it. Thank you very much.